Brian Jones, creator and founder member of the world's most successful rock and roll band, is found dead in his own swimming pool. The date, Wednesday, July the 3rd, 1969. The verdict, death by misadventure while swimming under the influence of drink and drugs. I was in this churchyard in 1969, covering the funeral of Brian Jones. The scenes were chaotic. The parents and family of Brian trying to be respectful of his, of his passing. His fans going berserk, lying over the coffin, lying over the grave and crying. A scene of utter chaos. Brian Jones's funeral took place at St Mary's Parish Church in Cheltenham and was attended by hundreds of fans, onlookers and celebrities, including Rolling Stones, Bill Wyman and Charlie Watts. This is the story of Brian Jones and the Rolling Stones, as told by those who knew them, including Tony Calder from the Rolling Stones management team. Discover Rock and Roll's original golden boy, drug abuser, womanizer, and founder of the greatest rock and roll band the world has ever known, Brian Jones. Let's face it, the future as a Rolling Stone is very uncertain. Brian was born in Cheltenham on the 28th of February 1942. He was born to a respectable middle class parents. His father Lewis was an aircraft designer, his mother Louisa an accomplished piano teacher. Despite the idyllic setting of the classical English spa town, Jones's family life was never easy. Following the death by leukemia of his younger sister Pamela, Brian's mother seemed to isolate him and he felt pushed away and unloved. Brian's excellent schooling gave him a promising start. He passed nine O levels and two A levels apparently with ease. But it was clear from an early age that Brian's life would not be conventional. Aged just 16, he was sent to Europe by his shocked and outraged parents following the revelation that his 14-year-old girlfriend, Valerie, was pregnant. Valerie later had the child adopted. Despite his parents' high hopes, Brian had no stomach for a career in anything other than music. He half-heartedly tried a number of jobs, but his formative time was spent in the Cheltenham Jazz Clubs where Brian was able to use his fast developing musical skills to jam along with the local bands.
Um, I first met Brian, I would think, um, memory serves me right, um, 1960. Phil Crowther, who was our lead guitarist then, introduced him to the band and brought him along for a session. He became a full-time member, um, playing in fact uh, guitar and uh, sax. The Ramrods uh, were playing predominantly rock and roll, uh, a lot of Little Richard, Chuck Berry, um, that style of thing. In 1962, Alexi Corner had begun his Rhythm and Blues Night in West London at the Ealing Jazz Club. It was here, inspired by blues musicians like Elmore James and Muddy Waters, that Brian made the fateful decision to start a band of his own. Was it coincidence, fate, or sheer magic that conjured up the next event? At a busy railway station in Dartford, Kent, two young men stood on the same platform. The first, a certain Mick Jagger, was carrying several rock and blues records. The second was Keith Richards. Keith barely recognised Mick from primary school and would have ignored him completely if not for the music he was carrying under his arm. He's got the best of Muddy Waters and Rockin' at the Hops by Chuck Berry under his arm, you know. Hey, man. <laughs> nice to see you, but where'd you get the records? <laughs> In April 1962, both men were in the audience at the Ealing Club. They had gone to hear the drummer Charlie Watts. With Charlie on the stage was Brian Jones, who gave a superb rendition of Elmore Jane's Dust My Bloom. Mick and Keith were hooked, though Brian didn't invite them into his band because he already had performers in mind. However, following several failed lineups, Mick and Keith were eventually auditioned and signed up. The Rolling Stones' unofficial promoter and manager was Giorgio Grimalski who encouraged them through their early days when the audiences were sometimes smaller in number than the band they came to see. However, under Grimalski's guidance, their popularity grew and soon people were queuing to see the new blue sensation. The audience just stood there like, completely shocked and didn't know how to dance to it or how to react to it because they never heard the songs, never heard the rhythms. Uh, it was bizarre. So we used to sit on stools and smoke cigarettes and drink beers and just play amongst ourselves. And if the audience clapped or something, we kind of looked around and, ah. Oh. And if they didn't, we just talked amongst ourselves and carried on. It was a bizarre experience. If Andrew had not met and taken on the Rolling Stones, I think they would have broken up in you know, six months, a year. You would never have heard of the Rolling Stones. Originally, it was Brian Jones's band. They were a blues band, and they were playing blues clubs, blues nights. So they went down very well because they loved their blues. Andrew Luke Oldman, a self-styled publicist, took over the Rolling Stones' management in 1963. I love Rolls Royces. I love sort of big flashy manners and things like that. You know, I'd sort of love to have big dogs and go shooting and have yachts and things like that. Andrew's vision was totally different. He wanted that rock iconic. He wanted Mick up front. He encouraged Mick, he taught Mick, he guided him, he persuaded him. He did everything he could to get Mick to be up front. And that's what Mick did. Mick grabbed it. And that's why it became the type of band they were. Mick led from the front. Keith was tucked in behind. Um, they were fabulous. And Mick's whole thing in the early days was to get the crowd to jump on the stage. And then we ran. Um, if they didn't jump, shame. When I first met the Stones, Andrew told me that Brian Jones was the leader of the band. But you see, this is where Andrew's iconic establishment vis-a-vis -vis the media, which was called the press then, came into play. Andrew realised that Mick Jagger was the star. Whether he was the leader of the band or not, it didn't mean a thing to Andrew. And everything had to be focused on Mick, because to focus on five people was too big a spread. And already he could see that, that with the Beatles, the split between the media for Paul and John was so diverse, it was cutting out the amount of extra publicity or the control of the publicity that they should have had.
I remember we went to the Apollo to see James Brown. James Brown did one of his all-time great concerts. Now, how much Mick picked up from that, I'm never sure, but I think he learned a lot that night. It became obvious to Andrew that, that, that there was a market out there that wanted something that the people could rebel against their parents. And Andrew just encouraged them to wear their own clothes and they got slowly, or well, decidedly, rougher and harder. And that's how the image got developed. Oh, a quick summing up of the band members. Charlie was fabulous. Ear tone, could you ring Shirley until I'm going to be late? Bill Wyman didn't speak to me, but then he didn't speak to other people either. Very quiet. Brian tried to make me his friend um, in his battle with Mick. Keith was great when he was on his own, wouldn't say much when he was with the band. And Mick was Mick. He was a great learner and a great manipulator right from the beginning. Oldham's plans were working like a dream and a make-believe rivalry between the supposedly lovable Beatles and the apparently loutish Stones were reaping rewards. Brian attempted to write his own songs, but with no encouragement or praise, his confidence began to desert him. He found solace the only way he knew how, through drugs, alcohol and sex. Brian Jones was the original leader of the band. It didn't fit with the way Andrew knew he had to project the band. The band fell in behind Andrew in, yeah, we'll turn his microphone off. We'll move his microphone to the other side of the stage. All little items that could have been cleared up if Brian had stood his ground. Um, it, it was those early things that probably knocked the stuffing or the whatever we call it today out of Brian that caused the problems later on. He couldn't cope uh, with the press coverage which was all centred on Mick. Uh, so little things happened. He was not told about recording sessions. He would be picked up late uh, for, for, for the transport for a gig when he pushed it the other way and decided not to be there uh, and would say, I'll be an hour later, they just left him behind.
Brian Jones became a major, major problem. Initially it was his band. Andrew took Mick, pushed him up front, encouraged him. Didn't really encourage Brian at all. Was party to many tricks to downgrade Brian. Brian walks into the studio expecting all the band to be there. They'd actually recorded the track the day before. And there, leaning against his guitar amp, was a note saying, play only on these 24 bars, nothing else. And again, it was like horror, because they'd done the whole song without him, and they didn't actually want to be in the studio with him. But downgrading Brian meant massive loss of self-esteem. It was a gradual process of moving Brian to one side. Uh, Mick had been encouraged to grab it all for himself, and then when Mick had taken the ball by the horns, Andrew then worked on Keith to make him like the number one and a half guy. I would say once Andrew realised the potential he had in moulding Mick into the focal point of the band and pushing him up front, he realised he had a casualty in Brian Jones because Brian wouldn't conform and fit in. And as far as Andrew was concerned, he was out. We were playing Berlin on the first Rolling Stones European tour. And Andrew very quickly noticed that the audience was 98% male. You couldn't recognize a female in there. So Andrew said to him, you know, goose step back across the stage. Mick would always take it one step further. So Mick not only goose stepped, he raised his right arm in salute. 180 cars were wrecked at the car park and rock and roll concerts were banned from Berlin for the next 25 years. Now that appeals to Andrew. And the, the fan base got bigger and bigger and bigger because it appealed to that element that wanted a revolt against their parents, against everybody. The Stones did two tours of America where we lost money. The third tour, we broke even. Satisfaction was the real break record. I can remember we were driving along the Pacific Coast Highway and we punched a station and it played Satisfaction. We punched the next button, it was Satisfaction. All five stations on the five buttons were playing Satisfaction. We knew they broke on the record. You have to appreciate that as the 60s developed, the, ma the national newspapers, which had now taken rock and roll to its front pages, became more and more interested in rock stars. So therefore, they'd spent years being utilized by people like Andrew Oldham to build up their artists. So now they were interested in trying to bring them down. Typical, and it's a situation that still exists today. Now, the band's obviously been using drugs since, since before they became famous in varying shapes and forms. However, there were journalists hanging out backstage who were trying to find out whether were they were just smoking, were they doing a line of coke, what were they doing? What pills were they were popping? So as it got to 66 and 67, the interest in the national newspapers grew to the extent that the police were working hand in hand with the national newspapers. So, it so happens that when the News of the World raided Keith's cottage with Mick in it and Marion Faithful, who was there outside with them but the News of the World reporter and photographer? So it was a marriage between what the, the newspapers thought the society wanted to read and also part of their campaign to destroy the Rock Acts. So it got heavier and heavier. 
Brian's biggest problem is the drugs he was taking were probably far more lethal than the rest of the stones. They had different reactions to different drugs, and whatever Mick and Keith were taking, Brian wasn't. So therefore, you had people on, on a different path. Mick and Keith had no problem with Charlie, because Charlie was on his own trip. Bill Wyman followed. Um, but it soon became apparent he just wasn't in the right place. There were occasions when Brian hadn't turned up at the studio, um, pulling the, uh, the great I am or I'm incapable, which was more likely to be as, it, as his drug abuse developed. So yes, he would turn up at the studio one night and he'd, they'd say, right, we want you to put this part on here, we want you to play this here. And he always did it. Brian got involved with Anita Pallenberg, who took him on even further trips and mysterious journeys. The relationship changed and she felt trapped because, it, because he became violent. And Brian, the nice guy by day, became the very unpleasant person by night. Somewhere along the line, Keith just stepped in and took her away, I think initially to rescue her but took her away and he, Keith and Anita became a, a couple for a long period of time. And I don't think Brian ever, ever forgave him for it. Brian got on a journey or a trip, which really you could see was self-destructive. And there was only one end. The drug situation was there from day one and that everybody smoked dope and everybody smoked hash. Much later, the grass arrived from Thailand. Brian lived in a world of his own. The drugs had taken over. Um, there was no reality. A lot of pills, a lot of acid, um, and probably smack at that time. From what one knows of Brian's early life, maybe the music business was not the best business to be in. Maybe to be in a band that became so important and so big as the Rolling Stones was his wrong choice of band. Maybe he should have just played blues with Alexis Corner, who was like the godfather of the band, um, the musical godfather. I've heard stories that Brian was forming the supergroup with Jimmy and John Lennon. We've all heard these whisper stories and little bits and magazines over the... Again, it becomes rock and roll folk folklore. I'm sure anybody of Jimmy's ability and John Lennon's ability would only have to jam with Brian for a couple of hours to realise the guy had become a passenger. Uh, once he got a whiff or hold of any chemicals that were going, in a way, that was the beginning of a very fast end. My ultimate aim in life was never to be a pop star. I enjoy it uh, with reservations, but um, I'm not really sort of satisfied, either artistically or personally. Oh, I have a lot of regrets, but generally speaking, no. I'm very satisfied with what's happened. I firmly believe that today that Andrew is not given the true recognition for what he did for most people in the industry today. His imagery of Mick Jagger and then the devil in Keith Richards set 
up rock and roll to get it onto the front page of the newspapers. It became television news, it became newspaper news. And it set a standard people have tried to copy and follow. Many have followed. Uh, I don't think anybody really surpassed what was achieved in that 64 to 65 period. It was number one after number one, you know, get off of my cloud, satisfaction, 19th nervous breakdown. I mean, these are classic rock and roll, pop rock and roll records. You know, the older people go to see the Stones concert and they wait for the old hits because, quite frankly, the hits that Andrew produced with them weren't necessarily the greatest records of all time, but each record was a statement. And it's a statement that the Stones have come to live by. And it's a statement that everybody's copied and followed since. The parting of the ways between the Stones and Brian Jones was regretted at the time and expected, and when you look back at it, you realize it had to happen. Brian had fallen apart emotionally and physically. Um, sure, we encouraged Mick and Keith, um, but they'd also realized that Brian had been left behind. The Stones had moved on, he'd become a liability. And really, in a way, it was quite a unique situation that you actually got rid of a member of the band. You didn't really do that at that time. So they dumped, they fired him. As I understand it, it was Mick and Keith that told Brian he had to go. Um, in a way, as I was told by Andrew, it, it, Brian took it as a relief. Um, and the atmosphere, once he left or was out, changed dramatically. Um, but you just somehow felt that Brian wasn't long for this world. Brian and I had drifted apart and I was living under the impression that because Brian's dream had become a reality and that the band was extremely successful that Brian was, you know, very happy. I feel anger at the fact that the two people who should have been there protecting him and, um, you know, taking care of him were actually the two people who were taking the band away from him. Brian's drug abuse was so appalling, he was incapable of playing. And he wasn't really fired, he was just told goodbye. He was, you know, it was, it just happened that he was no longer available as a, as a, a competent human being to turn up to record or to play. I understand it was Mick and Keith that said to him, look old chap, time's up. He had asthma as well. So to use a nebulizer, he made a big effort, like he would do it in the middle of a take. It was his form of grandstanding and, look, I need attention. Mick and Keith were the wrong people to ask for attention from. In November 1968, Brian bought the beautiful Cotchford Farm, former home to A.A. A. Milne, the orphan of Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh. Jones realised the damage that the drugs were doing to him and was making a desperate attempt to pull back from doing irreversible damage to his mind and body. Although an excellent swimmer, Brian mysteriously drowned in his own swimming pool on the 3rd of July 1969, just three weeks after he had been sacked from the Rolling Stones. Some suspected that he was murdered. My view on Brian's death, it was, it, it was an act that was going to happen. Um, you know, we all follow the adage that, um, as children, you can't swim after you've had your lunch. 
um, I don't know what time it was, but Brian was always having his lunch. If he actually started eating, he would eat. So to eat your lunch and then take some, whatever you take with those nebulizers, and then take a handful of pills and take a line of Coke and a line of smack and, and then go for a swim, it's something you knew that was going to happen. He wasn't murdered. The Rolling Stones were booked to do a concert in Hyde Park, which went ahead despite Brian's tragic death only two days earlier. Les Perrin, the PR guy, called up Andrew, and I took the call, and he said, Brian's died. He's been drowned in the swimming pool. And I said, so thanks, OK. He said, well, you better be ready. You need some quotes. He said, do you know what you're going to say? And I said, yeah, it's just a great loss, but um, it wasn't unexpected. I think it affected the band by a rather large sigh of relief. I was very surprised and shocked, obviously, when uh, I heard the news that Brian died. Um, he was, of course, a um, major um, musical influence, actually, in the British rock scene, and very sadly missed. My memories of Brian uh, were of a very accomplished musician, um, very quiet, rather introspective, um, not as probably publicly portrayed. Um, he was uh, very keen on the ladies. Um, we had some uh, great parties. Um, his association with uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, I believe, um, uh, is fundamental, actually, you know, to the success uh, of the Rolling Stones. Um, a lot has been written and uh, stated over the years, but uh, his was a, a major talent, and I think um, without Brian, uh, Brian Jones' uh, involvement, they wouldn't have been the band that they uh, turned out to be. Uh, the Rolling Stones certainly wouldn't have uh, enjoyed the success and sustained success that they did without Brian, uh, Brian's involvement. Um, he was a major talent um, with the band, um, together actually with um, his stage presence, I think was very important as well. Brian didn't want to be helped. Brian was quite happy in his drug period, or the, his drug life. Didn't want to come out of it probably didn't think there was a way to come out of it or whether there was a life without drugs because he stooped that far down into his dependency on, on hard drugs. Oh, I'm really looking forward to it, I really am. Nice one, Diane. What's Charlie going to do? He's going to play the drums. The drums. Do you think he's going to wave at you? Oh, yes, he's Wow. I'm really quite nervous. I'm never nervous usually, but I am a bit. Really? It's been such a day. Got any reactions, Nicholas? What are your reactions? Mick Jagger dedicated the concert to Brian. The gesture was not to everyone's liking. The concert in the park for Brian was pretty sick. Um, Mick letting off the doves, reading some Shelley. It was a shroud, really. Oh, Brian will be at the concert. I mean, he'll be there. I mean, it all depends what you believe in. If you're agnostic, he's just dead and that's it. When we get there this afternoon, I mean, we're gonna, he's going to be there. I don't believe in Western bereavement. You know, I can't suddenly drape the long black veil and walk the hills, but it still is very upsetting. And what to make it so that Brian's send-off from the world is as filled with as much happiness as possible. The tribute to Brian in Hyde Park was a marketing ploy for the Stones to move on to the next stage in their career, put them back in the limelight, absolve themselves from any public guilt, um, Mick wearing the frock designed by Ozzy Clark, the frock dress. It was pure television, great theatre. Listen, yeah. who's introducing this? Listen, the first thing that's going to happen is when we get on the stage, I'm going to read something 
which is Quran, and the song that we all want to think about him today. So the first thing that's going to happen is that I'm going to read something which is for Brian, and I hope they all agree with what I say about it. But can you say that I'm going to let you prepare for it? Yes. Because otherwise, you know, it might be it's difficult to them to shut up. No. It's a very nice crowd. I mean, everyone's obviously very happy, but I reckon it's reckoned there's 650,000. No. Yeah. The greatest rock and roll band in the world. They're incredible. Let's hear it from the start. Okay, now listen. Now, will you just cool it just for a minute? Because I really would like to say something for Brian. And uh, I'd really dig it if you would be with us when I, well, what I'm going to say. I really, I really don't know how to do this sort of thing, but I'm going to try. And I hope you can just, just cool it just before we start. And I really hope, if you do, I really appreciate it. If you could just so a few words what I think I feel about Brian, and I'm sure you do, and what we feel about him just going when we didn't expect him to, okay? Okay, are, we, are you going to be quiet or not? Okay. I just want to say something that was written by Shelley, and I think it goes with what happens to Brian. Peace. Peace. He is not dead. He does not sleep. He has awakened from the dreams of life. It's we that are lost in stormy visions and keep with phantoms an unprofitable strife. And in a mad trance we strike with a spirit's knife, invulnerable nothing. We decay like corpses in the charnel. Fear and grief, com grief convulse us and consume us day by day. And cold hopes swarm like worms within our living clay. The one remains, the many change and pass. Heaven's light forever shines. Earth's shadows fly. Life, like a dome of many colored glass, stains the white radiance of eternity until death tramples it to fragments. Die, and if thou wouldst be with that which thou dost seek, follow where all is fled.